won't be before you long this morning, but turn with me in your Bibles to the gospel according to Matthew. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 7. We'll take the last portion of this pericope, verses 21 through 27. All of our visitors this morning, I see some new faces around this morning. We're going to recognize you a little bit later on, but we say thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us on this day. We know that you could have worshipped anywhere, but we thank you for coming by New Sardis Baptist Church. Those who are online, we honor your presence on this day. Matthew's Gospel. This is near the end of a sermon that we refer to as the Beatitudes. It reads in this wise. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Jesus says, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I would tell them plainly, Jesus says, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doer. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Somebody say the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished his sermon, the crowds were amazed at his teachings because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. The word of God for the people of God and the people said together, amen and thank God. For just a little while this morning, pray with me and pray for me as we use this subject for which to preach when action speaks louder than words. When my actions speak louder than words. The grass withers, the flower it does fade, but the word of our God shall remain. In Jesus' name, amen. When action speaks louder than words. Beloved, I'm from an era well, we used to say things like this for folk who talked all the time. We would say, yeah, they talking loud, but they ain't saying nothing. I, I don't usually speak in absolutes, but I am convinced this morning, beloved of God, as a matter of fact, I'm 100% certain that the world will never experience a deficit when it comes to individuals who love to talk, but they can't back up their talk with their walk. And don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters, uh, I have no problem with honest conversation and thought-provoking dialogue. I have no problem with value-added discourse. It's refreshing, even therapeutic, every now and then to hear a good joke that makes you laugh until your side hurts. It is good to hear uh, some laughter every now and then that makes you move until your heart's desire. But that's not what I'm referring to on this morning. But rather, I'm simply acknowledging the person or the persons who have an answer for every one of your questions. They have individuals who have solutions for every one of your problems, an antidote for every one of your arguments, and advice for all of your adversarial situations. They got all the answers for you, but they ain't got not one for themselves. Now, I found this morning, brothers and sisters, that these personalities that specialize in massive verbal persuasion, many of them find a great sense of significance and importance in their own unilateral dialogue. Nevertheless, their discussion and their deliberation very seldom ignites the fire of discipline to get anything done. In other words, they love to talk but rarely can they walk it like they talk it, young people. 
They've earned an A-plus in articulation, yet their actions, if graded like uh, uh, Marvin Sapp, they never would have made it. I'm reminded of what Shakespeare said when it came to these types of personalities and these types of profiles. He said they are full of sound and fury, yet they signify nothing. In this morning's text, brothers and sisters, Jesus prepares to close his sermon. The Sermon on the Mount. And last week we discovered some of the people that Jesus was dealing with, some of the folk that he was in fact preaching to. Uh, he healed the multitude on last week from all of manner of diseases. And after he miraculously healed, after he cured, after he cleansed, and after he restored their bodies, then the Lord began to cultivate, to ameliorate, and to elevate their beliefs. Let me say that again. Wake up and follow me, somebody. I said, after he cured their bodies, after he cleansed their bodies, after he began to cultivate what was going on on the outside, then he began to elevate and ameliorate their beliefs. You remember his target audience on last week. It was uh, some folk who were on, down on their luck on that faithful day. Folk who understood disease and uh, destruction on a personal level. Y'all remember what Matthew 4 and 23 through 25 said? Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the gospel and healing every disease and sickness among the people. 24 says news about him. Who is him? Jesus Christ. Uh, got out all around Syria and the people brought to Jesus those who were suffering severe pains, demon possessed, those having seizures those who were paralyzed, those are, he healed everybody who came to him, y'all. Everybody who sought to be healed, Jesus healed on that particular day. Before he preached, he performed. Verse 25 says, large crowds from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and the region all across the Jordan, they ended up following him. Here it is, brothers and sisters, the messianic prophecy, the coming of Christ, the imago Dei, which means the image of the invisible God made in flesh there in the first century world. He did not just come to give a healing offering or a uh, miraculous manifestation, but rather the Messiah spoke light into dark places and gave healing to those who were hopeless. He wanted humanity. To realize these through three things. Wanted humanity to realize mental edification, spiritual application, and soul restoring transformation. Jesus just didn't come for you to come to church on Sunday morning and dress up real nice and pretty and uh, sweat your new hairdo out because you're shouting around. No, Jesus came from an intelligent standpoint so that you can do these things, have some mental edification, which means that you learn of him. And when you learn of him, you ought to be able to lean into him. Jesus came so that you would have um, some spiritual application when you understood and you learned from him and then you moved into leaning into him, you would do some of the things that Jesus did. Then Jesus came so that you would have some soul restoring transformation. That simply means that uh, while you're passing through this world of seeing others, your life shall view, you got to be clean and pure without within and let others see Jesus in you. And when your soul is transformed, you can help transform somebody else's soul. Is there anybody in the house this morning that knows that this world needs its soul transformed? This morning's text is tailored to teach us that when we are truly touched by God, it's not enough just to talk the good talk, but rather our testimony should mobilize us to provide mercy for humankind and grace for all that are involved in the human race. Listen to what the Lord tells these folk. Listen to uh, his sermon on that particular day. Check out this message and how he makes the message clear and concise, practical and plain. Verse 21, he tells us here, he says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
But these are the ones that are going to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven on earth. He said, those, he or she, that does the will of God. Hmm. He, he didn't say those who just talk about God's will. He didn't say those who are, are, are carrying a big Bible under their arm or they have a nice cross crucifix around their neck. He said those who not just talk about it, but those who walk in the will of God and who work in the will of God will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. Sounds like to me that you have to first and foremost have a willing relationship. Jesus makes it plain here as he advises his captive audience that you don't need to name drop unless you're willing to work and unless you're willing to walk being dependent on the rock. Let me say that one more time. He said, don't worry about name dropping unless you're willing, ready, and able to work and to witness for the one that sent you. Y'all remember Matthew 16 and 18 when Jesus was talking to Peter. Peter was kind of an up and down figure. Every night you never knew who you were going to run into running into Peter. Uh, you may run into the Savior's friend one day and you may run into Satan's friend the next. You never knew who you were going to run into but Peter got it right one time. Uh, Jesus said, look here man, flesh and blood didn't reveal what you just said to, to me but upon this rock uh, I'll build my church. He said, and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus wants us us to know that in order to be in right relationship, you must be able to work and to worship simultaneously. You, you must be able to go to FedEx and carry your faith with you. You, you must be able to go to international paper and carry your Christian integrity with you. You got to be able to go to 7-Eleven and carry your ecclesiology with you. You've got to be able to go into the classroom and carry Christ right there in the classroom with you. And while you're working and you're worshiping, you've got to be able to walk and witness at the same time as well. This is why there are some folk, y'all may not know any, but somebody online, you know somebody who knows somebody. There are some folk who like to brag about their spirituality rather than be their spirituality. This is why you have to walk and worship at the same time uh, because there are some folk that want to tell you about their church instead of being the church. This is why you need to tell them, brothers and sisters, because there are some folk who are comfortable with quoting Bible scriptures. You done learned a few Bible scriptures. You were in Sunday school years ago. Uh, you want to quote it, but you don't want to live it. We often want to see others and uh, want them to see how good we look versus showing them how godly we can be. But come here, Edgar A. Guest, talk to us for a little while when uh, he told us I'd rather see a sermon than to hear one any day. I'd rather someone would walk with me than to merely show me the way the eyes are better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel can be confusing, but example is always clear. And the best of all preachers is the one who lives their creed for to see good put into action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you let me see it done. I can watch your hand in action but your tongue it may very well run and the lecture that you deliver may be wise and true but I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do for I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give but here it is there is no misunderstanding how you act and how you live when you have a relationship with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ ain't nobody got to tell you to stop lying I said, when you have a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, ain't nobody got to tell you to love nobody or to take care of nobody or to feed. When you got a relationship with him, uh, you ought to be able to look like him from time to time. Why? Because birds of a feather, they do flock together. And association brings about assimilation. If you know who, Je if you love Jesus, then you ought to be able to show some sign. Let me pause for the cause right quick. Are there any Jesus lovers in the house this morning? Are there any folk who had a chance to fall in love with him yet if you fallen in love with him then you ought to be able to love somebody because God so loved us 
that he gave his only son and whosoever believeth in him don't have to perish. You can give your production to somebody else. Why? Because God loves you and in order you ought to be able to love somebody else. Hey. You, you got to have a, a relationship with the Lord. Verse 22 says, many will say on that day, Jesus says, Lord, Lord, uh, haven't we prophesied in your name? Uh, uh, didn't we cast out demons in, in your name? And uh, Didn't we do all of these wonderful works in your name? Uh, then 23 says, uh, then I will plainly say to them, I, I don't know you. I, I never knew you. Away from me, you worker of iniquity. Now, that, that kind of challenged me, Deacon Hines. Because see, I, I realize in Jeremiah 1 and 5, uh, we, we get a verse that says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, something took place between being before being born and what's going on now in reality. Jesus can say, I, I don't know who you are when you allow the culture to control your Christianity. Jesus can say, I, 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 I knew who she was. I knew who he was when uh, uh, I put him in their father's, uh, 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 when I put him in the mother's womb. I, I knew who uh, he was. I knew who she was because I know I planted love there. I know I planted joy, unspeakable joy there. I knew I put some good sense there. I knew I put patience in that particular uh, uh, situation. I knew that all of these good things were there. I know I put grace and mercy into that situation and into that particular person. But all of a sudden, says, I got a good job now, and I live in another neighborhood. And because I got two or three cars now, and because I got uh, 2.5 children, at 0.5, I got a dog, and I call him my son. Because I got new suits and I'm able to wear fine clothes and fine shoes, I look at people as less than. And uh, Jesus and uh, the, the Lord says, I, I'm looking down upon that particular individual. And I really don't know that particular individual because I did not put the spirit of jealousy in their heart. I did not put the spirit of uh, judgmentation in their heart. I did not put evil in their existence. I didn't put that there. So they have been uh, re re building a relationship with somebody else. We have to be careful, brothers and sisters, to cultivate the relationship with Christ. How do we cultivate the relationship with Christ? You've got to know his name, but not just his name. You've got to live with his nature. You've got to know his name, but you also got to walk with his nature. Nature. How do you walk in his nature? Here it is. Uh, you must till the soil of truth, not only in your life, but you ought to be able to till it and tell it in somebody else's life. How do you uh, cultivate? How do you uh, name him and walk in his nurture? You've got to fertilize folk with your faith. Why? Because without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. For the one that comes to God must believe that God is and that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How do you... Uh, walk in his nature. I'm glad you asked. You got to water them with words of hope and words of encouragement and words of affirmation. You've got to embody your ecclesiology. You've got to live your theology. You've got to personify the promises of God. There must be a willing relationship. But not only must there be a willing relationship, you ought to have some worthy stewardship. got to have a relationship, but within that relationship ought be some stewardship. Verse 24 says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, whoever hears this preaching, Jesus says, and you do what I'm saying, I will liken unto you an individual who builds your house on a rock. Oh, that's good news there. That, that's good news to my ears. The Lord is closing his sermon on the mount. 
And Reverend Downey, he's letting us know, he's advising them that, uh, yeah, get your edification, but edification without application, it leads to devastation. Let me say that one more time. Uh, get, get your education, get your edification, get all the learning that you can, but in your edification, you've got to get some application, learning how to do. He said, because if you don't do that, if you don't edify and apply, then you will die here on earth before they bury you. He wants us to understand this morning that we must cultivate a relationship with Christ in our actions. Nevertheless, within our relationship, there must be quality stewardship. Webster defines the word stewardship as the conducting or the supervising, the managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. That's number two. In the Greek vernacular, the word is oconomos. Say that with me, oconomos. Oconomos, that is where we get the word economy from in the English vernacular. And this word oconomos in the Greek, uh, it, it means managing one's household or managing, caring for one estate. Uh, it gives us the understanding of the duties and the responsibilities of a treasurer. And a treasurer, Deacon O.B., has to take care of somebody else's money. I said, say, he had to take care of somebody else's money. And so you have to get somebody who's trustworthy, not somebody who's looking, uh, who has an issue with uh, uh, being nervous around plenteous and plentiful resources. You got to get somebody who's honest and forthright when it comes to being your treasure, when it take, taking care of goods. You know, if you get a treasurer uh, who's already been to jail once or twice for stealing, you in trouble. Yeah, you, you got a, a fox in the hen house, you, you in a world of trouble. But it gives us the understanding that this particular treasurer is one who will take care of the house. This word uh, okos, it means house. This word nomos, it means rule or law. This is the origin of the word stewardship. It, it means house rule or house law. And let me give a big shout out to Brother Michael Gray. I know he's probably online this morning, Reverend Bernadette Gray, but he gave us an excellent uh, class, an excellent education in home ownership this past Wednesday night. Thank you so much, uh, Lady Rowena Featherstone, our economic empowerment ministry. Just a shameless shout out there. But he told us about how important it is to own a home, but not just own a home, but to take care of the home, to make certain that the deferred maintenance is met. Don't let your house go too long. Don't let it go 10, 11, 15. 15 years without painting it. Make certain it's grass cutting season, y'all. Don't go two months and not let your grass get cut. Make certain that you edge it up every now and then. Make certain that you trim your hedges. Make your house look good. Why? Because you are a steward of what God has blessed you with. Make certain that you rake the leaves up when it's time. Make certain that you clean your windows out every now and then. If something has fallen off, don't let me come there next year and the same limbs and the same boards that were down last year, they still down this year. You got to take care of what God has blessed you with. Yeah, in, in ancient cultures, a steward what was not the owner of the house, brothers and sisters, but uh, rather a steward was hired or contracted to handle or to manage daily operations. Uh, the steward had to make sure that the yard was manicured, uh, Deacon. He had to make sure that uh, no maintenance was needed. He made, had to make sure that all of the bills were satisfied. The steward had to make sure that there, were, there was food in the pantry. And, and the Bible talks about so many houses. And Loran, he talks about uh, in the Bible, the house of David being uh, the lineage of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, Minister Farmer, in the Bible, we learn that the, uh, uh, Bethany is the house of affliction, and uh, Beth Avon is the house of vanity, and uh, Bethsaida is the house of mercy, and Bethlehem, y'all ought to know where Jesus was born, is the house of bread, and Beth El is the house of God. But let me give you something real this morning, just in case you didn't know. Each and every one of us represent an upgraded house, namely a temple. It's in the word. 
It's in the word of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, uh, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? The t that, that's in you and whom you have received from God. You don't belong to yourself. You are a steward of that which God has blessed you with. Yeah, and because you are a steward of what God has blessed you with, you, you ought to be able to look at Romans 12, 1 and 2 in a different way uh, when it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, how holy and acceptable unto God. This is your true and uh, proper worship. Doc, when you are one who's a steward of somebody else's property, then you all do your best to take care of the one who was so generous to you. You ought to be able to feed that house right and to exercise that house right. And you ought to be able to uh, make certain that your emotional quotient and that your IQ is in place with that particular property that God has blessed you with. You shouldn't dog that property out all of the time. You shouldn't question uh, the intent of that particular property all of the time. Why? Because there is something that's been planted down in your property that's good and that's great and that's gracious and as long as you got some Something. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, what, what's down on the inside of me, it is a gift that has been enclosed in an earthen vessel. I said I got something down on the inside of me that's better than that which is on the outside of me, but that which is down on the inside of me controls everything that's around me. Is there anybody in the house this morning that knows all you got to do is to think yourself into a better situation? I felt pretty bad this morning. Old bum knee didn't want to walk for me this morning, but I said, Lord, if you let me get up and put one foot in front of the other, I tell you what, I'm going to go on to New Sardis and tell these folk how good you've been to me. Stomach was hurting last night, didn't feel like getting up coming to see y'all this morning. Oh, but if you tell the Lord, Lord, I appreciate you for what you already done for me. And if you help me one time before, I know you can help me again. Yeah, Jesus teaches. He teaches there are two types of builders. Uh, he says there's a wise builder and a, a foolish builder. He says uh, the foolish builder uh, built uh, his house on a, on a foundation that was not solid built his house on sand. And, and when he built his house on the sand, the winds blew, the, the rain came, uh, the billows, they uh, flowed, all of these things came. The pressure descended upon this house. And what did our Lord say? He said that the house was leveled with a great crash. He said, oh, but the wise individual he says when problems try to impede their progress, when issues try to trap them, when conditions try to cancel them, uh, when, when they built, they built on a rock. And when you build on a solid foundation, oh, let the winds come. When you build on a solid foundation, folk can lie on you. When you build on a solid foundation, folk can uh, call you everything but a child of God. When you build on a solid foundation, folk can leave you. You can have a true friends and a true enemies and fake friends. When you build on a solid foundation, stuff can come your way and it can't fade you. Yeah, when, 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 when you build on a solid foundation, that's when you can really say that no weapon that's formed against me it's going to form, it's going to come up, it's going to flare up, but no weapon that's formed against me shall be able. Why? Because I'm standing on a firm foundation. Come here, Whitney. Whitney says, where do I go to uh, when there's no one else to turn to? Who do I talk to when nobody wants to listen? Uh, who do I lean on when there is no foundation stable? I go to the rock. I know that he's stable. I go to the rock. Come on, Whitney. What did you say? The Lord is the rock of my salvation. I go to the stone that the builders rejected. I run to the mountain and the mountain he stands by me. When the earth all around me is shaking sand on Christ. Yeah, on Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need shelter, when I 
need a friend. Where do I go? I go to the rock. When I need somebody to understand me, I go where? When I need somebody to hold me in the midnight hour, I go to... When I need somebody to supply my every need, I go to... When I need somebody to shine the light from heaven on my soul, I go to... I go to the rock because I know he's able. I go. I go to the rock. We got to go, family. You got to have the right relationship. You got to have the right stewardship. But then third and finally, we got to go. You've got to have a worshipful leadership. You, you've got to have the right relationship. You've got to have the right stewardship. You've got to manage your affairs well. But then you've got to have the right leadership. This is what the crowd said after Jesus preached his sermon. Deacon Ezel, he said in verse 28, when Jesus had finished preaching, he got finished saying what he had to say. The crowds were amazed at his teachings. This is why they were amazed. He said, because he taught with one who has authority. Not like all of the other teachers. Remember what Jesus did. He healed them first. Then he helped them. He did something. He acted first. And then his actions fulfilled that which he articulated. The Savior wants society to adopt a new consensus and a new clarity when it comes to the culture. He helps these individuals who are lame, lost, and left behind. Yet the Lord gives them a new perspective. And along with the new perspective, the Lord gives them a plan, he gives them a purpose, and he gives them a promise. Reverend Robinson, I'm glad today that God has given us already a plan, God has given us a purpose, and God has given us a promise. As a matter of fact, I don't have to worry about going out and trying to figure out what I'm going to do in this lifetime because I've got a plan, I know my purpose, and I know that God has given me a promise. I, I was with the Sisters Affirming Sisters yesterday, and we had a wonderful time. I, I, I don't know if Sister Linda Redborough is here today, but we had a wonderful time with the young ladies, men of valor. We're going to have to do something for the young men. And we had an opportunity to talk about economic empowerment and how we should be good stewards of what we're blessed with and how you got to give every dollar a destination and how you have to have a plan of action in your life and how you have to move beyond your plan on paper and you have to pursue what God has placed, helped you placed on paper. And we told them that your actions have to speak louder than your words. Why? Because you determine, you make a decision what type of life you want to live. Young people, since it's Youth Sunday, let me help y'all this morning. You make the determination what type of life you want to live. You make the determination. You make the decision uh, how you want to move in life and how you want to matriculate through life. You make the decision what kind of money you want to make by uh, uh, working hard. You can't be whatever you want to be. You can be whatever you work to be in life. Let me say that again because some of y'all parents didn't hear me. Stop lying to your children. You can't be whatever you want to be if you don't work for what you want to be. You can wish until your head fall off. You can wish until you turn blue in the face. But if you don't get up in the morning and read something and apply yourself and go to somebody's certification or somebody's school, you ain't got to worry about being something in life. You can be whatever you work to be in this lifetime. But we talked to these young ladies on yesterday. And Lady Crivens, I had to let them know, regardless of what type of economic empowerment you have, you got to make certain that you're with the right person. And since we were talking about, we were talking with the ladies, I had to let them know you, you got to be careful about what type of Negro you hook up with. You can have excess funds. You can make $200,000 a year and be in a deficit every year because you're with the wrong man. 
Yeah, he, he, he fine and he look good, but he driving your car and got your credit messed up and got your situation all turned around and got your family upset with you because she doing good, but that Negro that she with just won't let him get ahead. And so we have to tell him that you have to be careful about the relationships that you have, even while you're building upon your stewardship. But oh, I had to let him know that there is a leader who allows us to plan, a leader who allows us to understand purpose, a leader who understands what it is to pursue, but then it's a leader who gave us a promise. And I started thinking about that little song that we used to sing a long time ago, I Am a Promise. I am a possibility, Mother Howell, I am a promise. With a capital P, I am a great big bundle of potentiality, and I am learning to hear God's voice, and I am trying to make the right choice. I am a promise to be everything. Did y'all know anything about that in elementary school? They don't sing them type of songs anymore. They need to bring them on back into this thing. But I started thinking about the promises of God, and I went to 1 John 1, 9, where it says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is a promise. Uh, there's a promise in Psalms 37 and 4 where it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart that is a promise there's a promise in Philippians 4 and 6 where it says be anxious for nothing but in everything somebody say everything with prayer with supplication and with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God and the peace I said the peace that goes beyond all understanding will guard your heart in Christ Jesus. Psalm 84 and 11. There's a promise right there when it says, For the Lord God, a son and a shield he is. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That's a promise. There's a promise in Hebrews 10 and 23 where it says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering. For God who promises is faithful. Then I looked at Romans 8 and 28 when it says, and we know. Does anybody know in here? You need to know that you know that you know that you know that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and for those who are the call according to his purpose. Is there anybody here today that knows that God will give you a promise and that God will forgive and that God will allow you to live within his promise? How do you know? What do you have to do? You have to serve him. Here it is and I'm gone. Hath thou not known? Hath thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not, neither does he weary. There is no searching of his understanding, for he giveth power to those who are faint and to them who have no might. He increaseth their strength. Even the youth shall faint and become weary, and the young shall utterly fall. But here it is. Here is the promise. They that wait. I said, here is the promise. Y'all don't know when to shout. They that wait. If you serve and never doubt, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk. They don't have to worry about faint. Somebody here needs to know today that if you trust him, he will provide. I've learned how to lean and to depend on him. I've learned how to trust in the Lord. For I figured out that if I trust him, with my actions, he'll provide. I said he'll provide. He will provide. He'll be food when you're hungry. He'll be water when you're thirsty. He'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll be a mother for the motherless. He'll be a father for the fatherless. Why? Because I've learned that he'll provide. But your actions, I said your actions have to speak louder than your words. That there may be somebody here who's trying to figure out why stuff ain't working out for you. You pray. You try to do everything you know to do to make life right. But what about the way you're acting? What about the way you're treating other people? What about the way you treat yourself? What about the way you move in the world? Come on, let's give God praise. Come on, y'all, let's give God some praise. If you're here today and you're looking for a church home, if you're here today and you've not been baptized, if you've not accepted the Lord as your personal Savior, go 
Go ahead and make your way. Just stand wherever you are. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to Christ today. And you've been wondering, wishing, and waiting. Today is not a day of anticipation. There's too much going on in the world to try to figure out whether or not you're going to be in right relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just stand wherever you are. If you've not committed your life to Christ, if you've not committed yourself to a church home, just stand wherever you are and we'll meet you wherever you are. You deserve it. You deserve to be a part of God's house. You deserve to allow your actions to speak louder than your words. Wherever you are, if you want to recommit yourself to Christ, just stand wherever you are. Just stand wherever you are. There may be somebody online who needs a church home, somebody online who's looking to restart your relationship with the Lord and you want to make certain that you're part of a good fellowship, a godly church. Not a perfect church, but a church with purpose. Just go ahead and put in the in the tab right now that you want to be a part of New Sardis Baptist Church. Go ahead and type that in right now. Thank you. Is there another? Is there another who's ready to put your trust in the Lord? Is there another who's looking to make your actions that which are anointed in our Lord? Anybody ready to make your next move your best move? Just stand wherever you are. I'll trust in the Lord until I die. Gonna stay on the battlefield. And when you're on your battlefield, let me tell you something, your actions, they have to speak louder than your words. Amen. Amen. Can we bless God for these that have come today? I said, can we bless God for these who've come today? We have Sister Vicki. Wheatley, who's come to us today uh, to restore her relationship here at New Sardis Baptist Church. Amen. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Thank you so much, Sister Wheatley, for coming on back home. You've been a member of New Sardis Baptist Church before, and you're saying today, before God and these witnesses, your church family, that if you accept it in as a candidate for restoration, you'll serve, you'll proclaim, and you'll sacrifice for the goodness and the glory of God. That's what you're saying, Sister Willie. Amen, amen. Can we give Sister Willie a big round of applause? Let me welcome you to your new church home, to your restored church home. And then we have Brother Jalen Stewart. Amen. A little steward, isn't that something? We talked about stewardship today, and he said, I got to go. Amen. Jalen is coming to us by way of baptism today. Can we give God a hand praise? Come on, y'all. We can do a little bit better than that. Jalen is going to be baptized. Jalen, this decision means that you've accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. You believe that he died for your sins and that he got up from death with all power in his hands just for you. Do you believe that? The Bible says if you believe it, you accept it in your heart then you're already saved. You're just as saved now as you will ever be in life. And there's some information. We've got some of our youth leaders here that are going to take you, get some information from you, and then share with you all of the things that we do here at New Sardis Baptist Church. We don't just have events, but we mix evangelism within our, our events. Amen? Amen. So we're so excited about what God's promises are for both of you as we move forward. Come on, y'all. Let's give God a hand praise. Amen. Our leaders are going to take you to the office now. And any question that you have, any concern you have, they should be able to address it. Amen. And thank God.